So in the previous lecture, we have seen this uh, interesting result uh, with respect to eigenvalues and eigenvectors, where we have seen that if your matrix, because now I'm not going to talk about operators in general, we're just going to talk about the matrix representations of those operators. Since we shall be dealing with finite dimensional vector spaces and subject to an ordered basis, you can always represent things as like things like operators as matrices, square matrices. But al also any linear transformation can be represented as you know, rectangular matrices in general, right? So what we have seen is that if you have a, a square matrix that represents a self-adjoint operator, and in the parlance of matrices, we will say that the matrices of a complex field, they'll be Hermitian. That is, they'll be equal to the transpose of the complex conjugate. So if you take the complex conjugate of each entry of the matrix and take the transpose of that matrix, that'll equal the original matrix. So in such a case, we've seen that the eigenvalues, firstly, turn out to be all real. They can be repeated, but they'll all be real. Secondly, doesn't matter whether they're repeated or not, you'll always be able to diagonalize such a matrix through a you know, similarity transformation or a change of basis. Thirdly, this basis also happens to be an orthogonal or you can make it orthonormal, right? We saw a proof for that. Are there any questions about the proof? I felt maybe we had hurried through the proof. So I can quickly recapitulate if you have any doubts about the proof that we finished in the previous lecture. Any queries you have about the proof? If you've gone through the proof, that is. Yes? Oh, how are we proving it is an orthogonal basis? So what we did was first we chose some arbitrary lambda. Then we expanded this, if you, if you remember the steps. I'm going to quickly go through, run, run you through the steps again. So what we did was we chose an orthogonal basis, V2 till, what was it? What was the size we had chosen? Vk. So this was k plus one, was it? Ah. So then uh, this maybe belongs to k plus one cross, k plus one. Okay, so that was a running variable the induction. So we saw that for every Hermitian matrix of size k cross k, as a base step of the induction, we assume that it is orthogonally transformable through a set of series. So at least any uh, Hermitian matrix of size k cross k has an orthonormal basis as it's, you know, the eigenvectors, they form an orthonormal basis that we have assumed. Now we have to show that for the k plus one cross k plus one also it is true. So what did we do? We added this and then we saw that this led to what? So the first fellow will become lambda v. The rest of it is just a v1 through till a v k, like so. All right. Now we hit this one with v Hermitian, which are basically row vectors now. Right. So we hit this side also <coughs> with the same thing, which is v Hermitian, v sorry v1 Hermitian until Vk Hermitian, like so. And what did we have a, as a result of this? Because this, by my choice, formed an orthonormal basis, yeah, so every one of these inner products, with the first column at least, yeah, what does it turn out to be? Zeros, right? So the right-hand side we saw then turn out to be just <coughs> lambda here and all zeros here, right? And these, I really don't care too much about it. And this is sitting here, is a k cross k matrix here, right? It has, we, we still don't know. We will infer about the structure of this one. This is some k cross k, right? Because this is of size k plus one cross k plus one. This first, these starred entries are essentially v Hermitian a v1, v Hermitian a v2 till v Hermitian a vk. That's what these entries are. I've written them as stars because at the moment, I have not inferred anything about them. Now, once I've done this, I notice that A happens to be A Hermitian. Now, if you look at this, this is V Hermitian, this is A, this is V. What can you say about this matrix? If you take V Hermitian A, V, the whole Hermitian, the order gets reversed, remember? So this becomes V Hermitian, A Hermitian, V, but because A Hermitian is equal to A, you further write this as V Hermitian A V, which means that this matrix is also itself 
Hermitian because when you take its Hermitian it returns the same thing which means that this right hand side fellow must also be Hermitian is also Hermitian right now this side is also Hermitian what does it mean if this entry is 0 so must this entry be 0 if this entry is 0 so must this entry be 0 in other words now I can say that this must also be 0 furthermore if this entire fellow has to be Hermitian this k by k block sitting here must also be Hermitian otherwise this entire thing cannot be Hermitian so if this entire thing is Hermitian for the base step of the induction what have I assumed any Hermitian matrix of size up to k can be orthogonally diagonalized right through an orthonormal set of vectors so this one now let me write this as uh, let's say yeah uh, v sigma well, let's not use sigma let's use lambda hat maybe v tilde v uh, v tilde lambda hat v tilde hermitian hmm? this is ortho orthonormally diagonalizable so this is exactly this v tilde is exactly that vector which orthonormally diagonalizes this where this fellow is that diagonal representation of this fellow so this I can write as lambda 0 0 and v tilde this big lambda which is k cross k diagonal and v tilde Hermitian like so so let's start with this step now take v Hermitian a v is equal to lambda 0 0 v tilde lambda hat v tilde Hermitian you agree with this yeah so from this can I erase this now I, I suppose I can right so from this we may we may now deduce that v rather let me hit it with v on the left and v Hermitian on the right so what I have is a is equal to v uh, I'll do something I'll just take 1 0 0 and v tilde right then I'll write this and I ask you to convince yourself that this is indeed true this is going to be 1 0 0 v tilde Hermitian and v Hermitian <coughs> right now what it means is that this fellow can be diagonalized by this fellow acting on the left and this fellow acting on the right you may readily check that one of them is the Hermitian of the other complex conjugate transpose of the other the order obviously gets reversed all that I now need to show is that the product of these two fellows is identity and I would have shown you that there is this orthogonal or orthonormal set of vectors that indeed diagonalizes A so what I have to show is that when you take the product of this and this it devolves to the identity so that is I would put it to you quite straightforward just do a multiplication like so this is V tilde and then you have 1 0 0 V tilde Hermitian V Hermitian what do you think is this going to result in <coughs> well because this is of, of course an ortho orthonormal vector so this product with this leads to identity of size k cross k so this in, in between you will have one and block diagonal identity of size k cross k which means this entire thing in the middle is just identity of size k plus 1 cross k plus 1 and then you will be left with v v Hermitian right what about v v Hermitian by my very choice I had made this I started with an eigenvector v and the rest of the vectors were chosen 
to extend it to an orthogonal basis itself or an orthonormal basis for the k plus 1 dimensional n tuples right. So, this is also going to be identity which means that this indeed this fellow or this fellow they are what you call unitary matrices such matrices are called unitary matrices. So, this is what you call a unitary matrix and now check that if you hit with uh, V Hermitian here and V here or you can hit it with V on the right this fellow gets pulverized. So, in fact this V and this this entire object let us give it a better name V hat. So, in fact this V hat is actually going to be your set of eigenvectors <coughs> yeah straightforward no this is this is what V hat Hermitian. So, hit A with V hat on the right what you will have is A V hat what happens with V hat Hermitian times V on the right here identity. So, you will have V hat but what is that? That is a classic definition of the eigenvectors and eigenvalue equation is it not? It is just decoupled I mean if I just write it like that this is A let us say this is ok let me give it V 1 hat V 2 hat till V k plus 1 hat is equal to V 1 hat V 2 hat V k plus 1 hat times lambda 1 lambda 2 till lambda k plus 1 equate each column on either side and you have indeed the eigenvalue eigenvector equations. So, each of those V 1 hat V 2 hat till V k plus 1 hat are indeed eigenvectors. So, that establishes that I mean whenever you say that it is diagonalizable using a unitary matrix it means the eigenvectors are orthogonal right because that is how we diagonalize we diagonalize using the eigenvectors. Now, if it is unitarily diagonalizable it means that it is basically the eigenvectors that are forming an orthogonal or you can normalize them and form an orthonormal basis in this case right. So, this is a great property we will readily see an application of this maybe something that you have learnt in high school, but now you will see a very elegant application of this idea to uh, such a problem. You already know how to solve it I am guessing, but uh, let us look at this nonetheless. Because this is a very special class of matrices now we are dealing with you see we started with this uh, eigenvalue eigenvector problem for any arbitrary matrix n cross n we did not impose any structure on it, but now we have suddenly moved on to symmetric matrices why are we so interested in symmetric matrices after all or Hermitian matrices for complex case right because these have very practical applications that is what motivates us. So, we will try to invest a good deal of time probably the entirety of this lecture on seeing some applications of this and let us see how far we can get with that. So, you remember when you learnt about conic sections maybe in your plus 2 levels right you had a parabola which you sketched like this yeah. So, y squared is equal to 4 a x kind of thing then you had the ellipse yeah x squared by a squared plus y squared by b squared is equal to 1. Then you also had hyperbolas like this which is also obviously x squared by a squared minus y squared by b squared is equal to 1 and these are all very uh, you know straightforward prototypes of these curves, but things start to get complicated when you have a quadratic expression in x and y and you have cross terms. I mean you can probably guess that if you have something like a x squared plus b y squared plus uh, c x plus d y plus e is equal to 0. This is not that difficult to deal with right why just complete squares. So, it is basically a translation of the origin 
This is not difficult to deal with. You just complete squares here, take a common, so it's x squared plus c by a x plus something, something squared, and that tells you exactly how much shift you're giving about the origin, but the shape remains undistorted. Whether it's this, whether it's this, or whether it's this hyperbola, it just causes a translation. But the real ugly stuff starts to happen if instead you also have plus 2h xy kind of term. What does that generally correspond to from your experience or from whatever you remember from plus 2 level? Rotation and perhaps distortion also. So you tend to get ellipses that no longer look like this nice form where the principal axis, the, the, the major and the minor axis are just along the x and the y directions. You can start to get ellipses such as this and heaven knows what else, right? But wouldn't it be nice if by looking at this equation, of course, there is some formula probably if you have in your, if you have seen in your coordinate geometry books, you'd see that they give you some mystical, some formulas, they check this h squared minus this, 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 this. And if this is true, then it's a hyperbola. If this is true, it's an ellipse. And you know, you have to memorize all these sort of things. But it would be better if we had a better understanding of what's going on here. So here's the idea. Anytime you're given an equation such as this, which is obviously the equation of a general conic section, shifted and rotated in some arbitrary manner. And if you have to find out whether this corresponds to a parabola, an ellipse, or a hyperbola, what do you do? Apart from remembering those nasty formulae, right? Any time in your life, forget about formulae. That's one of the things we hate to do, right? So what do we do? Here's what we do. Focus on this part. Because this part, as I said, is just a translation, not difficult to figure out. If I focus on this equation, can I not write this in the following manner? Just notice <coughs> yeah? Doesn't this part have a representation like so? What is so interesting about this? The representation involves a matrix which is symmetric. Oh, B, it should be B, thank you. Yep, it should be B. So it's a symmetric matrix nonetheless, right? Now if it's a symmetric matrix, I'll t I'm telling you that we are back in business with whatever we've learned now. How so? What do we know about this symmetric matrix? It's a special class of Hermitian matrices when the entries are just real. Hermitian is for general complex matrices. Here the complex conjugation did not happen. Just transposition suffices. So what can we say about this? It is diagonalizable by a, I mean unitary is for complex matrices. You can just say orthogonal matrix, real orthogonal matrix or an orthonormal matrix you can say, right? So this part then turns out to be what exactly? Yeah, if I call this the A matrix, that I have, oh, I've erased it, that I was dealing with up until this point, what does that A lead to? V Hermitian AV is equal to some diagonal matrix, which means that A is equal to V diagonal matrix times V Hermitian, in this case, V transposed. And V and V transposed are inverses of one another. That's the beautiful part about it, right? Because it's, it's diagonalizable by an orthogonal matrix. So it's V diagonal V inverse, which happens to be the V transpose. In such cases, the diagonalize, I mean the inversion process becomes very simple, no? If it's an orthogonal matrix, it's just the transposed. So I'm gonna take up this term, and I'm gonna write this in the following manner. X, Y, and V, some diagonal matrix, times V transposed times X, Y, okay? And now I'm going to say that let X, Y equal to V X bar Y bar. Then what happens?
what does this part then become? What can you say about this part now? Look at this. V transpose x y is what now? It is just x bar y bar. Is it not? If x y is equal to V x bar y bar, then you hit it with B, V transposed on both sides. Then what do you have? X bar y bar is equal to V transposed x y, which is nothing but this fellow sitting on the right. So this is equal to this diagonal times x bar y bar and pre multiplied by also x bar y bar check. Is it not the case? It means that now you have transformed your basis, you have chosen a new basis. Originally you had the x y, so this is x, this is y, this is x, this is y, this is x, this is y and now through this transformation you have gotten rid of this pesky cross coupling term here. Now because you know the standard forms of these equations, if you look at the equation in terms of x bar and y bar, it is just a change of basis. The nature of the curve won't change due to that, right? So if you know what the curve looks like in terms of x bar y bar, inherently you have answered the question about whether it is an ellipse or a parabola or a hyperbola. Yeah. You can go ahead and apply the same transformation to this part as well. This part of course E remains constant but this part as well you can apply and then you can see what sort of a shift it is in terms of x bar y bar. So in the x bar y bar frame of reference, it is basically been decoupled. What was coupled in the x y coordinate system has now been decoupled in the x bar y bar coordinate frame. So forget about all those formulae, all those determinants and writing up all those things, right? In fact, you can just go back to your plus two level maths books if you still have them and go back to the equations that you have and check that this is indeed what's happening. You can take that as an interesting exercise. That formula using some determinants probably you had, right? Check the sign of the determinant. You can check that it exactly corresponds to something that we've now seen here, right? So when you have this decoupled, you basically mean that when you're saying that it's going to be an ellipse, you need both the diagonals to be positive. When you need a hyperbola, you need them to be of opposite signs, right? And when you're talking about a parabola, you need one of them to be zero. And at least one of these fellows to exist. The other fellow, in fact, the one that is zero, the other fellow must exist. Yeah, at least, right? Then you can represent it as a standard parabola. Right. So the point is that just through an application of this elegant idea that any symmetric matrix can be orthogonally diagonalized, you can just check for the kind of conic section that a quadratic form like this represents. And if that doesn't sound very impressive because you all know the formulae for all of this, let's just jack it up a bit, just crank up the level of difficulty a bit and hopefully this is something you've not had too much experience with which is when we talk about quadric surfaces in 3D. Yeah, we talk about ellipsoids and paraboloids and hyperboloids and stuff. You might have had some experience, but I'm pretty sure you've not dealt too much with them. Mostly we deal with 2D Cartesian geometry in our day-to-day -day lives. So let's just give you a quick glimpse of uh, what lies in store. See, the idea is still the same. From a two cross t, two symmetric matrix, it will change to a three cross three symmetric matrix. When this, yes, you have a question? Right. In the plot, are we doing a rotation of coordinates? So you can check what is the relation between x bar, y bar, and x, y through this relation. This V is just an orthogonal matrix. That's a very interesting question. Thank you. Basically, what is the relation between x, y, and V, x bar, y bar? If you look at the norm of this and the norm of this, because this is a unitary or a Hermitian or a, you know, not Hermitian, sorry, no, it's a unitary or an orthogonal matrix. It's a non-preserving matrix. It's non-preserving transformation. You can just check. I mean, x, y times x, y. On the one hand, this is x squared plus y squared. And you can check over there, v, uh, x bar, y bar. And you, here you have 
x bar, y bar, V transposed. So this V transpose V from the middle, it vanishes. Yeah, so this is also going to be x bar squared plus y bar squared. So such, such transformations just cause a rotation, just the right sort of rotation that gives you another orthogonal basis on the basis, on, on the, in terms of which you can actually represent these curves in the standard form. So it just rotates them sufficiently. The x and the y direction, it causes just a sufficient amount of rotation. Like, I just want to confirm, like, uh, after that happens, hmm. uh, the x bar and y bar are oriented in such a way that they, they are orthogonal now. Axis. Yeah, they will be orthogonal now. Of the curve, which is. Yeah, of the, based on this curve. So now you are representing the curve in terms of x bar and y bar. So any linear transformation can be captured by what it does to a basis. So you take this, let it act on x0. You take it, let it act on 0y and see what sort of a rotation it causes to x and y. You will see that at the end of it, the rotation that it causes to x and to y to lead to x bar and y bar, that actually leads to a config, final configuration of x bar and y bar so that they lead to an orthogonal basis. Right? That's the beauty of this transformation. Right? Yeah. Yep. How is it? No, this is V transpose V. This is just identity. So if it's identity, you, whether you write it or not, doesn't matter. So it's norm preserving. That's true of any, any size, anything. If you have an orthogonal matrix or a Hermitian matrix, it preserves the norm. All it does is rotate, cause a change in the direction of vectors. When orthogonal matrices act on vectors, they just cause a pure rotation to every vector. Every vector is not rotated by an equal angle, but if you take a uh, enough number of fellows, which is to say the number of fellows that constitute a basis, and if you see the actions, then you know what it does to any other vector. But it will never cause a change in the norm because of its nature, it's norm preserving, right? So now uh, let's crank up the level of difficulty a bit and see that when you are faced with curves that contain much more than just x and y, but also z. So maybe you have f z plus, oh, let me just rewrite this equation again. I mean, I don't want to delegate x to be, I mean, z to be unimportant. So it's a x squared plus b y squared plus c z squared plus 2 h x y plus 2 g y z plus 2 f x z plus whatever it is. Uh, I'm running out of variables now. E x plus k y plus l z plus m is equal to 0. Whew, so many terms, right? But we still need to focus on only the part that's quadratic, which is just this, is it not? Right? So what is the representation? Again, needless to say, it's going to be a symmetric matrix, A, B, and C, H, H, uh, what is it? Y, Z. So that would be G. G and X, Z is F, F. So this is at the heart of it. This is what the matrix is. And now I'm going to just, you know, I'm not going to just derive this and all. I'm just going to give you a few sketches of the standard quadric surfaces. So of course, a standard ellipsoid has an equation like, like so. That's an ellipsoid. What does it look like? Well, of course, I cannot do a very good job of drawing it, but you have to imagine that this, this is what an ellipsoid looks like. Yeah? Yeah. So this is a standard ellipsoid. Uh, if you have a hyperboloid, there can be actually two kinds of hyperboloids. 
So, one kind of hyperboloid would be x squared by alpha squared plus y squared by beta squared minus z squared by gamma squared is equal to 1. So, this kind of hyperboloid looks something like this. Okay, let me take the z here, the x here. Yeah. Oh, wait. Maybe I should x, y, z. Yeah. X, y, z. So, this hyperboloid, you will have to imagine this by the way. I cannot draw a 3D object faithfully on a, on a blackboard, on a two dimensional board. Yeah. That is one kind of hyperboloid. There can be another type of hyperboloid which has no projection on the x, y axis what we call as a trace of a curve on an x, y axis. So, the second kind of hyperboloid would have a representation like so z squared by gamma squared minus x squared by alpha squared minus y squared by beta squared is equal to 1 which would look essentially like two bowls. So, this is y, this is x, this is z. So, it looks something like a bowl here that opens up here and like another bowl that opens up here. So, it never touches the x y plane and you can see why it cannot. If you put z is equal to 0, there is no x y that satisfies this equation. So, this fellow has no trace on the x y plane, right. So, that is a second kind of hyperboloid. So, this is a hyperbole, this is an ellipsoid, this is a hyperboloid of kind 1, this is a hyperboloid of kind 2. Of course, you can just stretch your imagination and think that this can be drawn along various principal axes just several permutations. Maybe I am biased against z, so I am doing it like this. Yeah. Essentially, it makes no difference otherwise. That is three types of quadric surfaces. Uh, you could, okay. You could also, you could also end up, end up with a so called elliptic cone, okay, which has an equation that looks like this. So, this elliptic cone, this is again the z axis, ah, where is it? Ah, x axis, the y axis. So, this elliptic cone looks something like this, where if you take cross sections of this, it is an ellipse, okay. And you can see that if you put z is equal to 0, then the only solution is the origin. So, it has no trace other than the origin on the x y plane. Yeah. So, that is a standard. So, this is elliptic cone. Okay. You can have an elliptic paraboloid which is like z is equal to x squared by alpha squared plus y squared by beta squared. So, this is an elliptic paraboloid. Okay. So, an elliptic paraboloid obviously, uh, this is y, this is x, this is z, this is x. So, obviously, this would have no uh, existence for negative z. So, the only thing that can happen is, yeah, it touches the origin. And you can just, I leave it to you as an exercise to check through your imagination. So, if you slice it like this, it looks like parabolas. But if you slice it like this, parallel to the x, y plane, it will result in ellipsis, right. So, this is an elliptic paraboloid. So, we have one kind of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and finally, maybe I will just get rid of this now since we have the expression for this quadratic part at least. And finally, we will have a hyperbolic paraboloid which is probably the most complicated of all of this. So, we have uh, if I am not mistaken z squared is equal to y squared by beta squared minus x squared by alpha squared. I would rather not draw this except <laughs> because I will make a mess of it. It is too complicated. It looks like that saddle that we talked about by the way. So, you can just check what happens. If you equate y is equal to 0 which is when you are talking about the z x plane, it will be a hyperbola. 
same with if you put x is equal to 0 yeah but on the other hand if you put any uh, if you put z is equal to 0 then this is basically a pair of straight lines but if you put z at some positive number then what happens sorry no y is equal to 0 will be probably a pair of oh wait is this z or z squared I seem to have forgotten that uh, but anyway this is going to be an uh, hyperbolic paraboloid sorry yeah it should be a pair of straight lines it seems yeah yeah if you put z is equal to 0 it will be just a pair of straight lines no in the elliptic cone also these are straight lines so if you put any one of these as 0 if you, if you slice them along x is equal to 0 or y is equal to 0 so if you take along the zx plane or the zy plane so visualize it here zx plane and the zy plane you will just end up with a pair of straight lines yeah it probably should be z I, I think yeah I think it should be z yeah yeah it won't have symmetry this one doesn't have symmetry so it should be z yeah because this one now if you put z is equal to 0 this just becomes a pair of straight lines right and if you put z as some positive number then you can just divide it out by the positive number and you get one kind of hyperbola if you put z as some negative number you can divide it by the z and you get the different kind of a hyperbola so that's why the shape is so what I'd rather not draw this No, 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 donuts would have some puncture in between. Those are like you are talking about toroids. Yeah, those will have some puncture in between. So, donuts are similar to your coffee cup, by the way, weird as it may sound. But yeah, so this is the hyperbolic parabola. Now, you can imagine that you have all these varieties, right, different types of curves. And now, if I give you that general equation like this, I mean, and with these cross terms, it is a difficult task. I put it to you to determine as to what kind of a quadric surface you are representing through that equation. But again if you apply the same idea and look for the particular orthogonal matrix that diagonalizes this then you have transformed it to some x bar, y bar, z bar new set of coordinates in terms of which there is no cross coupling and just by looking at the coefficients of these fellows and comparing them with the standard forms that I have outlined there you can tell what kind of a quadric surface you are dealing with right so its utility stretches beyond just the 2d that you are already familiar with in conic dealing with conic sections but also in in three dimensions when you are dealing with these kind of quadric surfaces you can just ascertain so that's a i think a useful application of the idea of this uh, knowledge about this uh, spectrum of a symmetric matrix that brings with it right okay we will show another result and probably that will take up much of our lecture today. I uh, will see how far we can get with the proof but the main idea is not just the proof but to give you an application of that idea and that is our next pro uh, point which is singular value decomposition. Okay?